Hello! My name's Siri Jones with Zen Maker Lab. I'm not Zachary Anderson. Today he wasn't able to make it, but we've got an exciting show for you today, starting with the Canucks Summer Giveaway Contest. We're really excited by this one. This stick you'll see here, this is a Canucks team stick autographed. It's going to be really cool. We are having our first judging panel by noon today to announce the winner on Monday. Uh, don't uh, Let's hear a little bit more about this contest uh, right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at our very first project here, which is Clancy's boat. Set sail for Impress. And this one is Jackson's R2D2. Now this cannon was made by Oscar Hudson's Deluminator. Next up we've got Daniel's Dice. Check out Oscar's Lantern. Here, let's play some Keaton's Crossy Creek. So there you've seen it. We are really excited by this contest. We're starting to get some awesome submissions. We've got some of the kids in our camps at Mulgrave and here at Zen that have made some cool things. So it's not too late to get your submission in this week. You need to get it in by noon today to be part of this week's group. And uh, to announce, we're gonna be announcing on Monday next week, the winner Monday morning on our Design Make Play show. How do you enter? What you do is you send us a picture and a brief description of your thing that you've made. It could be a 3D design, a model, some kind of contraption, invention, whatever it is, send it to designmakeplay at zenmakerlab.com. Designmakeplay at zenmakerlab.com. So that's, uh, we're gonna be doing this every week for eight weeks. This is gonna be quite the, the contest, quite the giveaway. We got cool products, we got signed hats, signed shirts, signed sticks, uh, and we're really grateful to the Vancouver Canucks for being our prize uh, donor in this. Okay, uh, just to let you know about the show ahead today, we've got some cool things. We've got a section on three-point perspective with Arian. We've got concept of time with Zachary. The fundamentals of balance with Coach Greg. We will have an engineering tribute to Nikola Tesla today and our maker profiles as usual. And uh, some special guests, Marco and Alexander Jones, some young entrepreneurs with Middle of the Sky. So that's the lineup for today. Uh, a few other th cool things that are happening, the summer camps at Mulgrave, although they have all kind of filled up, um, if there is interest in the one that we have next week, building an RC car, uh, there would be a wait list and if there's enough interest, then they can divide the class in two and, and open a second session. Uh, that we are running those camps with uh, extra precautions and small classes and social isolation just to make sure they're safe and healthy for everyone. And we also have some at Zen next week, a couple of spots. So uh, summer camps, if um, you're not sure what you're doing next week and you want to have a lot of fun and make some cool things, we have our summer camps. Those are some of the uh, cool things happening uh, right now. We've got an exciting announcement on Monday about a fundraising program where if your sports organization or other organization would like to raise some funds, I know times are a little bit tough at the moment. Uh, we have our face shields and we are also now starting to sell and distribute uh, face masks as well, so or a bundle. So these are something that you can uh, help protect your local organization at the same time, raise a bit of money for your local sports organization or a church or some other organization. And uh, you, you'll know that you're gonna be supporting some environmentally friendly, made in Canada, personal protection equipment. So we'll say more about that on Monday. Let's go and move on to our segments. Hello and welcome to another segment of Design Make Play Show. My name is Aryan, I'm the designer at Zen Maker Lab and today we're gonna learn about the last perspective technique, the three point perspective. So have your pencil and paper ready and let's get started. So 
on the last two segments we covered how to do perspective we did the one point perspective we did the road you guys remember that when things getting closer to us on that road things getting bigger when they go further away they're getting smaller on the second one we did the two point perspective somehow we created a three dimensional space that looks like we're standing on the corner of the building we used two points we made a surface and we will go on on that today we're going to cover how to do three point perspective and create a visual of bird eye view or a view that seems like you're standing at the bottom of a really tall building and looking up so let's, let's get started on that I'm just gonna starting off with putting two points on my paper I'm not gonna tell you where the third point gonna go if you guys can guess yes so it's gonna go right at the bottom of my two points let's just put it on there it can go in either way we're gonna try both in here so I'm just gonna try to create that surface that we did on the two-point perspective so let's do that I'm just gonna grab that draw the lines one two one two there we go now I have the surface in this case the surface is gonna be the rooftop of my building because my third point is at the bottom so what I'm gonna do from my third point I'm gonna cross the line going through these intersections so I'm gonna draw a line there we go and then I'm gonna do another one for the other side too already we can see that you're seeing some sort of a building in here that looks like we're looking at the top of the building but for putting more details I'm just gonna cross the line going from my two point per two points going crossing this and then again from the other one crossing the bottom one there we go like that nice it's magic now we can see that how I we created an angle that it looks like we're looking at the building from the top view so I'm just gonna connect these two points to two lines two intersections there we go and then I'm gonna draw this I'm gonna make it more visible erase the extra stuff again remember creating perspective is just a guide for you guys to create more complicated stuff so you can keep the proportion always the same this is the key key thing why we're using perspective so if you imagine if I can draw again if I draw two lines coming out there again two lines coming this way as you guys can see if I put the road line it looks like we're looking at the building really tall building in New York City or somewhere and people and cars just going around or if you always make that example of the the shot the really famous shot of the King Kong movie that the King Kong is on the top of the building and the, the airplane is looking at him so it's it's a really great example of seeing the three-point perspective and how that works in that movie so I'm not gonna add more details I'm gonna just go on and do the other way around so I want to do one that uh, it seems like someone is looking down from the building to the top so I'm just gonna go and do the other one so same idea I'm just gonna put two points in here instead of putting it at the bottom now I'm gonna put it all the way to the top now I'm gonna draw my surface same same idea There we go and then I'm gonna just cross the lines again from my third point to these there we go and the last one and this one 
So now that I have the third point on top there and cross the line between these intersections, now I'm gonna continue on and finish up my drawing. So I'm gonna just do cross the line to here. I'm gonna go really high because my building is really high. It's gonna be really tall. If you wanna go really tall, just cross the lines and really further on the top. And then, last but not least, I'm just gonna go and connect these two points together. There we go, beautiful. So now, when I'm finished with this, I'm happy with the drawing, with the fun, like the base of my drawing, and then I'm gonna erase the extras so that guy, you guys can see how I created that perspective of looking down to up. So there we go, I'm just gonna add more things. So if you want, you can add windows, whatever you want. You have to keep the guides always for yourself. So same as the to one point perspective, but in different ways. So things when they're getting go up in the sky, they're getting smaller. When they're coming down, they're getting bigger, right? So things getting, the window is gonna be really small on the top and while it's coming down, it's getting bigger. You have to do it with the lines, but I'm just making an example. There's a cool thing you can do. You can do a giant. Like, have you seen those giants that they have like a really, they go from, they have a really big feet. They're standing. Like their feet is really big because that's how they use three-point perspective to create giants. That's how you use three-point perspective to create something not just buildings. So you can create a human standing in a way that looks like somebody is looking down on him. Like you, somebody, you're looking up at him actually. So that's one way of doing it. So his head is getting smaller when it's going towards the sky. When we come to the ground, his feet is really big because it's more closer to us. This is the Three point perspective, putting the third point on the top, and this is the three point perspective, putting the point at the bottom. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this design segment. We learned all about the perspective. We learned about one point, two point, and three point perspective. Hopefully you guys use these techniques to create amazing designs. My name is Aryan. I'm the designer at Zen Maker Lab. Have a good day and take care. So last time we talked about how you could tell time with me drinking coffee. Now this episode, because I don't want to drink any more coffee, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about oscillators. So we can actually use oscillators to tell time and it's a lot better than me drinking coffee because it doesn't require me to drink the coffee. <laughs> I can actually just have some sort of battery or some other energy source doing the work for me. So we're gonna talk about three different kinds of oscillators. We're gonna have uh, mechanical ele oscillators, electrical oscillators, and atomic oscillators. So I'm really excited to talk about oscillators and please, uh, let's jump right into it. Throughout the history of the clock, there's been a variety of different types and variations on it. And we're gonna talk about three. So first up, we have mechanical, all right? So there are a variety of mechanical clocks that date back all the way to uh, even 1090 by Sun Sun, who actually created a water-based mechanical clock. So this was actually using pouring water and rotating wheels. Now, we are going to talk about two different kinds of mechanisms for the mechanical clock not involving water. One is the spring mass, and the other is the pendulum. So let's go ahead and take a look at the one that first came around, which is the pendulum. Okay, so here I've got my pendulum, and we can see here, this is nothing more than a string, okay, and a mass on the end of it. And if I lift one side, and I let go, we're gonna see that it rocks back and forth, rocks back and forth. 
This is what's known as an oscillation, okay? This is our first example of oscillation, and we're gonna see many of them today. This is our first example, and we can see here that my mass is going from one side and to the other, and it's gonna do this at a steady rate, okay? So it's going back and forth at a steady rate, and this is an example of oscillation. This is actually the definition of an oscillation. It's something that goes back and forth at a steady speed, okay? And we can do that again. And this is how grandfather clocks worked, right? There was that big pendulum inside that would swing back and forth to and fro with your ears, you, you know that one? If your ears hang low, if they wobble to and fro, you can tie them in a knot, you can tie them in a bow, you can throw them over your shoulder like a constant soldier. Your ears hang low. Well, they would probably swing like a pendulum. So the way this works is we actually have gravity that's pulling down, pulling back on the pendulum. And gravity sort of acting like our spring. So the energy here, when I first start and I let go, is being converted from potential energy into kinetic energy. And then as this comes back up here, right, now the force of gravity is pulling down back on the pendulum to bring it back down to that equilibrium. And it's gonna keep doing that. And it would do that forever, except we've got all kinds of frictions. We've got all kinds of dampening factors that eventually make our pendulum stop. So one of those things is air that's in the way. The other is maybe there's some tension in the string. Okay, maybe there's some, some loss in the string here. Maybe there's some loss um, from my hands. There's a variety of losses in this, in this system, okay? Otherwise, this would actually just go back and forth forever. Okay, so that's one example of a mechanical oscillator. Here we're gonna take a look at another example. So this is a spring mass. And here we've got a vertical example, but typically in clocks, like in watches and things, you'll, you'll see something more like this. Now this is an example of this same system that I'm about to show you, but in terms of a uh, more compact and circular form that we're used to. And that's known as a mainspring and balance wheel. Okay, mainspring and balance wheel. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this form of oscillation. So I'm gonna hold this spring here, and this is my mass, this Expo pen. And if I just move it up and down, you can see that this is actually oscillating, right? And this is oscillating at hopefully some, somewhat of a steady frequency, right? There is a resonant frequency, okay? That is the uh, amount that I move my hand up here a little bit. And every time I move my hand up here just a little bit, that energy actually gets stored, okay? If it's at the resonant energy inside the system here, okay? So this is my mass and this is my spring. So this is another kind of mechanical oscillation. So before we just had the mass and gravity, now we've got the mass and a spring. And these are actually how we were able to tell time. So when this piece comes up and goes back down, that is a replicable event, right? You remember maybe from last episode, when we drank a lot of coffee, that's, that was our replicable event, me drinking coffee. But now we've got a new one. We've got every time that this mass comes down, we're gonna count, okay? And this is gonna give us a higher precision in terms of measuring time. So those are our two examples of mechanical oscillators. Let's go ahead now and take a look at an electrical oscillator. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at what's known as a piezoelectric, okay? Now this is an electric oscillator, and here we're using the piezo effect, okay? So here I'm applying, or sorry, this is the inverse piezo effect. So here I am applying a voltage to some, some crystal, actually, that's inside of here. And when I do that, it's actually going to oscillate, okay? It's gonna do the same thing. It's actually going to vibrate. So a piezo is a component that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. So you see here, ooh, that hurts my ears. Let's do that again. Ow. Ah, can you hear that? So that sound that we're hearing are actually percussion waves, okay? They're actually air that's moving up and down at a specific frequency, okay? Again, oscillations, right? So here in this example, we are generating these big air waves, um, but for a lot of electrical devices, we actually use quartz crystals, and when we apply this voltage, it's actually self-contained, and it will oscillate at a specific frequency. So basically, we put in a DC voltage, and then we get out this oscillating um, AC voltage, okay, at a specific frequency. And this is one way that we're able to tell time in electrical circuits, okay? So in electrical circuits, we typically want some sort of, or we're measuring some sort of voltage or a current that's changing at a specific rate. 
And so when we have a crystal that's oscillating or changing at a specific rate, we can measure that and then count how many times that happens in a second. Now for a lot of quartz crystals that we see in clocks, like maybe that one up there um, behind me, or even in maybe like your, your digital watch, those quartz crystals are operating at a very high frequency. They're actually operating at about 32,700 hertz, okay? Now that is just outside of the audible range that humans can hear. If it was any lower, if it was in uh, the range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, then we would actually be able to hear all our digital clocks. They would be whining all the time, just like my piezo buzzer is. Ah, could you imagine having a clock like that? So luckily we've designed them to be outside of the audible range, but they do actually still make a noise. So that covers our electrical, uh, electrical oscillators. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the highest resolution, highest resolution oscillator, the atomic oscillator. So we just finished talking about mechanical and electrical oscillators. And remember that an oscillator, oscillation is the back and forth movement at a steady rate. And here we can see a typical graph of an oscillation, right? This might be a, this is a sine wave. So now we're gonna talk about atomic oscillation. An atomic oscillation is actually the most precise. As we go down here, we can actually increase in the precision and accuracy uh, of our measurement of time. Okay, so mechanical, electrical, and finally atomic is the most accurate measurement of time. And the, the way that we actually measure an atomic oscillation is by the electromagnetic waves that are actually emitted by an atom. So an atom will emit at a specific frequency and we actually count the cycles to determine uh, our measurement of time. And the exact measurement of a second is actually 9 million 192,630, uh, it's bigger than that. It's 9 trillion, 192 million, 631,770 cycles um, of, uh, of hyper fine transmission. So uh, that is a lot, that is a lot of cycles um, from cesium 133. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. We learned a lot. We learned that oscillation is the moving back and forth at a steady rate. We learned about different kinds of oscillators too. There's mechanical oscillators, such as the pendulum or the spring and mass. We learned about electrical oscillators, such as the quartz crystal, which vibrates at a specific frequency and is an example of a piezoelectric. And we learned about atomic oscillation, which is the emission of electromagnetic waves at a certain rate. So thank you guys so much for watching this video and gals, I will see you in the next one. Your challenge for this video is I want you to go out and find some other kind of oscillator somewhere in the environment, somewhere around you, go record it and see if you can figure out what rate it's actually moving at, it's actually oscillating at. Now this might be very difficult if you are trying to capture sound waves, but there are a variety of programs on your computers and phones that you could probably use to capture and figure out what the exact frequency or rates of something like that is. And there's lots of mechanical examples. Heck, you could make one of these. That would, this is a perfect example, right? Um, there's plenty of these things in our environment. So that's your challenge. Go out, document some sort of oscillator and tell me what the rate is. This week's been all about fundamental movement skills. Today, we're gonna to talk about balance. Welcome to the Play Zone. It's Greg here at Zen Maker Lab in the Design Make Play Show. We are going to talk about balance and agility today and work through some fantastic drills that teach you the fundamental movements of balance training. So, excellent, Carla. So okay. we're gonna do a little, uh, little compass balance drill. Okay. So imagine a compass with a north, Okay. West, south, east. Okay. And we're going to get you to stand on one leg. You're in a neutral position, which is good. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just ask you to balance your right foot. Okay. And then we're going to ask you to 
carry that foot north. Now we're going to ask you to come to the northwest mm -hmm. corner. Now we're going west. Mm -hmm. Now we're going southwest. Yeah. Now we're going south. Yes. You're going to cross over to the southeast. Oh, it's complicated. There you go. <laughs> okay. And then. now you're going to swing over around to the east. Here. Yeah. Here. And then northeast. Yeah. And then north. Okay. And back. That is, that's fantastic. It's really so hard. So that was a, that's the beginning of the compass drill, the okay. balance drill. So one, a couple of key principles with that drill. One is if you are unable to, to bring your foot up in back without touching the floor, that's fine. You're, you're, it's totally okay. okay. If you're a little bit off balance and okay. you want to touch the floor to regain your balance, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, and if it is, uh, if you're, you know, acing it like the way you did, now we're going to add some progressions. Okay. okay? Make it a little there bit more go. challenging. So okay. the first progression is the same compass drill, the same mm -hmm. sequence. This time we're going to try and have you this with a, a bent knee on your okay. left leg. So you're going to get a little bit lower into a squat position. Okay. And you are going to do the same okay. compass drill routine. Okay. Yeah, that looks great. Okay. Um, and using your hands to keep okay. balance, that's going to help you. Okay. Well done. So now north and northwest. Yeah. And west and southwest. South. Okay. Southeast. Okay. See if you can carry it over to east. <laughs> okay. Here. Yeah. And then here. Yeah. And northeast and then over to north. Okay. Impressed. That's great. <laughs> Very good. It's really hard. Yeah, really, no. really hard. You have great balance, so that's a, a real. That's I think that's a difficult drill, but you know, really again, hard. with those progressions, we can we can uh, you know try practice. If we mm -hmm. touch the floor, we just keep going, no problems. Yeah. So the last progression we're going to do today in our in our short segment on balance, mm -hmm. doing this compass drill is. Uh, Closing our eyes oh my while gosh. we do it. That is so, really hard. So same same drill, this time with our eyes closed. Mm, okay. Okay. Like this. Here we go. Okay. Starting at the north. North. Northwest. Okay. West. Okay. Southwest. Okay. South. <laughs> okay. <laughs> crossing over the midline. <laughs> okay. Here. Yeah, now coming back across the midline again okay. over to the east. Yeah. And the south, the northeast right there. <laughs> and okay. back to north. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was very good. That was actually excellent. Oh, um, a hard one. We're going to go counterclockwise now on the compass. Okay. So starting with north. Okay. And then northeast. Here. Yeah. East. Yeah. And southeast. Yeah. Now south. Yeah. Across the mid line yeah. over to the west. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can bring your foot back. Crossing yeah. over. Here. To, yeah, the northwest. The northwest. And then the north. The north. Very good. This one. That is so, pretty easy one. Very, very the other one is here, right? Yeah. Now it's with the bent knee. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going north. Mm -hmm. Northeast. Northeast. To the east. East. To, to the southeast. Southeast. South. South. Crossing the midline to, okay. to the here. Yeah. To oh. the west. Southwest. <laughs> now we're crossing back over to the west. Here. And then northwest. Here. And north. Here. Yeah. That is very, that, that, okay. Very good. Nice. So great. So again. To cap off here, we can keep doing these drills uh, to work on our balance with our eyes closed, with our knee bent, or just from our neutral position. And you can always co continue to improve on those drills to improve your balance. balance. Now that we've gone around the compass mm -hmm. with both our right foot and our left foot, yes. uh, what could you what could you tell me about? Uh, you know, there's some of the challenges or some of the issues oh, with some of the drills there. I think it, the hardest part was when I was closing my eyes. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh, super, super hard. Yeah. Do you know why? Like, I don't know why. Well, your vision and uh -huh. your and your inner ear uh -huh. are major contributors to your balance, your overall balance system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, these drills are really working your mid stability uh -huh. and, uh, you know, your eyes and your your inner ear. We can, when we get into more depth, in-depth balance training, mm -hmm. we focus on the eyes and vision training and, and inner vestibular training. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh you know. Yeah, I, I think when I was doing the, I think it was the left, the right. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of hard. Even just even just balancing, you know, in a neutral position, uh, and with knees bent, with eyes closed, you'll notice most people will have a like little bit of sway, yeah. back and forth, yes. left and right, and and uh, you know that can be overcome with practice mm -hmm. and that can also be overcome by doing vision training mm -hmm. and inner ear training but uh, you know for for uh overall mid stability mm -hmm. and balance the compass drill is a really good, really good exercise. every day take 10 minutes really good uh, you, up to 15 minutes a day doing balance training well, like and it. it's going to be helpful is for everyday life, whether you're riding a bicycle or walking or hiking the trails, right. if you have better balance. I can teach you one. Yeah, well, you see? <laughs> let's, let's, okay. this one is let's super easy. This one is super easy. This one is just stay really ground at the floor. Right? Yep. Okay. Really ground. This is, and then you, a, you're the coach. <laughs> I'm the student. Okay. Just now you're going just to put your leg up. Okay. Up, stretch. Yeah. And then just put it back and move forward right and then if you can just touch the ground okay and try just to move your leg on one side and then move your arms here and then go up and move your leg up and rest really good cool one coach yeah yeah I got, <laughs> I got a lot of work to do on that really one. good one really good but, one but uh it, yeah it was a little you know a little bit Take out of uh, coach's comfort zone, but it's fun to do, <laughs> fun to try. So now what about the other one? So try just with the opposite leg. Okay. It, right? To the back, up, up, up. Okay. Just put your finger on the floor so you feel like stability. Okay. And then you go up. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, in here. And just rest. Not very stable. Really, yeah. All right, so that was our balance class for today. Really it's a nice, nice short one, nice easy one. That one could be done between eight minutes and about fifteen minutes yeah. on a daily basis. And we'll see you next time in the play zone. Okay, I hope you enjoyed those design make play segments. The three questions for today, the first one related to design is what can three point perspective be used for? What can three point perspective be used for? The make question is what are the three types of oscillation? What are the three types of oscillation? And finally on the play segment, it is what is your favorite balance exercise? So that's a pretty easy one. You can come up with whatever you want for that. And the first person who emails us at designmakeplay at zenmakerlab.com will get a pretty cool surprise package that we're gonna send to you. Kind of a little mini maker kit with some things in it that we're gonna UV print your name on it. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Be the first one to send your response to designmakeplay at zenmakerlab.com. Okay, uh, we are going to be moving into the engineer profile. So the engineer profile today, we are going to be covering uh, Nikola Tesla. Now Nikola Tesla, I'm just going to put some uh, slides up here of Nikola Tesla and uh, let's talk a little bit about him. Now he was a really amazing engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, uh, Born in 1856, lived to be 86 uh, when he passed away in 1943. And he's probably most famous for, I'm just gonna move to my uh, slides here. I may need a little, uh, uh, just make sure that we got the slides coming in. And um, so Nikola Tesla was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, amazing engineer. 
And one of his claims to fame was being um, the inventor of alternating current. And uh, there was a big battle going on between direct current with Edison and alternating current with Westinghouse uh, using Tesla's uh, patents. And uh, in the end, the electrical uh, electricity system that we have in distribution is alternating current. And so that has been what um, uh, we, we, we mainly know uh, Nikola Tesla for. However, uh, we also know him for all kinds of other cool things. So there's the AC motor, carbon button lamp, death ray, induction motor, radio control, teleforce, Tesla coil. Those are just some of the things, the torpedo, uh, violet ray, wireless power transfer. There's a whole bunch of really cool things that he is known for. And uh, he's uh, often, um, uh, there was an interesting story when he first came to the United States for a while, he worked for Thomas Edison and Thomas Edison asked him if he could solve a really tough technical challenge related to uh, DC. Um, and uh, he solved the challenge and Edison had promised him that he'd get $50,000 if he solved this technical challenge. And once he did, after several months of hard work, Thomas Edison told him, you don't understand American humor, that it was just a joke, that there was actually no reward. So that was a little bit of a lesson for him that he's gotta be a bit more careful with um, the work that he's doing and the supporters. And he ended up uh, moving with Westinghouse, developing alternating current. And there was a period of time called the Battle of the Currents. Uh, and uh, one of the things with the battle of the currents was that uh, it was the alternating current versus the direct current. And ultimately it was the alternating current that was the system that um, uh, was kind of uh, the one that kind of won. Um, Westinghouse, the company ended up into some financial troubles and the royalty that it had with Tesla to pay him some money for all the use of the AC, they had to, they canceled it. And so unfortunately, Nikola Tesla didn't really gain a whole lot from that, but he did have enough um, funds from that early success to start his own company and continue on with a whole bunch of inventions. When we think of radio and the invention of radio, quite often we think of Marconi, but in fact, Tesla was uh, the one who had some early uh, patents uh, related to shortwave radio communications. And in fact, the year that Tesla died, 1943, shortly after the patent office in the US canceled four of Marconi's um, radio related patents because it was determined that Nikola Tesla had already invented those. So those are a couple of cool things. Uh, another interesting thing, I don't know if you can see the picture on my screen here, uh, thumbs up or thumbs down. All right, you can. So that's uh, Nikola Tesla age 23. Uh, and that is um, quite a while ago. Um, and um, basically what we see here, uh, when he was younger, he went to university for a while, but um, engineering and uh, he did actually drop out of university but one of the interesting things is he got cholera um, and he was bedridden for nine months his father was a Serbian Orthodox priest and wanted him to be a priest as well but when he was really really sick and almost died his father uh, promised him that if he recovered that he would send him to the best engineering school sure enough he did recover uh, and uh, one of the things he was doing during that time as well is he was doing a lot of reading including reading Mark Twain and Nikola Tesla said that uh, Mark, uh, uh, Mark Twain was an inspiration and helped him recover during that period that he had cholera. Later in his life, he ended up meeting Mark Twain when he was in the United States and they developed a friendship. And I think when one of the first, uh, some of the first inventions he did um, were photographed with Mark Twain there as well. Uh, so anyhow, that was uh, a little bit about Nikola Tesla, one of the most amazing uh, engineers, especially when you look at electrical engineering and some mechanical engineering. And so um, that is our engineering profile for today. All right, uh, we're gonna move on to a little bit looking at some of the profiles of some people um, and projects. So right, what I'm doing for this one, I'm just uh, gonna profile a couple of different things that people have made, some instructors here as well as some kids. And I just Google Zen Maker Lab and if I go to the images, uh, you can see there, there's a whole bunch of really cool things that show up and I'm just gonna kind of go through a few of them. Uh, first of all, we've got this one. So this is our RC car early days. This was developed by Fardine primarily, and then Zachary also helped out with it. But it's a really cool remote control car that you can program, you can control with a phone. And this is actually one of the products that, uh, one of the uh, kits that uh, the Mulgrave kids are gonna be working on next week in the camp. So that is the RC car. Uh, just going back a bit. MP3 player. So this is another one of the project kits that this one was designed uh, 
uh, mainly by uh, a guy named Tom Doad, uh, who uh, was working for Zen Maker Lab on contract to make this uh, MP3 player. And he's got a cool company uh, that does some programming, some interface and gadgets and things like that called Scridgets. And so this was the MP3 player, it's programmable. It was kind of a cool uh, project that a lot of the kids have made here at Zen Maker Lab. So that's another example of the kinds of things that people have made. Um, this is a picture of Nikolai. Uh, Nikolai is, um, works at Zen Maker Lab and he has, uh, he helped out with the design of some of the face shields, especially a kid's version of our pro face shield. So that just shows another kind of uh, interesting product that came out of um, Zen Maker Lab. LED uh, clock, this is a cool one. A lot of cool concepts of color, uh, programming, electronics. And uh, this one was uh, designed uh, in combination of Fardine as well as uh, Tom. And uh, it was, uh, it's one that we've used a lot here at um, Zen Maker Lab. LED night light, this is one that actually Zachary was working on until the wee hours last night. Some of the kids at the Mulgrave camp, they are working on assembling this really cool LED nightlight. So that's another kind of product here that uh, some of the makers make. Uh, let's see what else we've got. There's quite a few things. Uh, lots and lots of 3D printed things. You can see here's an example of some of the cool designs that some of the kids and others have printed here at Zen Maker Lab. Um, the MP3 player, once again, this one's cool. You can have an acrylic case. So there's all these different types of cases to change the looks. This way you can see the, the circuit board and the speaker, kind of a cool effect. Um, try a few more before we move into our interview segment. We've got, uh, once again, uh, interesting thing. A few more things. There was one that was uh, pretty cool. It was a sign. So maybe I'll end on this one. Um, this is Fardine working on our Zen digital sign. So it's a programmable sign. He laser cut uh, some aluminum. Uh, we had to get a larger laser cutter involved for that one and put them onto a board, connected it all up. Just like the RC car, it's controllable by a phone and you can end up getting all kinds of multicolored lights as part of the sign. And I think we've got a picture of that just a little bit down here. So. That gives you an example of what this thing looked like. So when you have a maker lab, you've got some 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC's, various tools. And on the art side, we have things like large format printers and UV printers and vinyl cutters. When you have a combination of equipment and you have some expertise and some people helping out, it's amazing what you can make. You can take, make your ideas uh, become reality and uh, it's a lot of fun. It doesn't always work the very first time you make something. It's an iterative process, takes multiple kind of uh, attempts and multiple versions. And if you want to get a really good, good uh, final product, quite often it might take 10 or 15 uh, versions before you get it sort of uh, how, how you like it. Okay, uh, so that kind of wraps up profiling some of the things. A little bit different than this time. Normally we were looking at specific kids, things that they've made. Uh, Zachary will be back with that on Monday. And once again, we will be announcing the prize winner for this week, uh, the Canucks Summer Giveaway. The, as a prize donor, we will, we will take a look at some of the cool projects kids have made this week and um, take a look at those submissions and award the prize Monday morning on the show. So make sure that you are uh, submitting your submissions and that you tune in Monday to see who the winner of that is. All right, so that is our, our engineering profile as well as our maker kind of uh, profile highlights. And uh, in a minute, we're gonna move on to an interview that we have with Marco and Alexander Jones of Middle of the, of the Sky uh, Company. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Hi everybody, this is Coach Greg at Zen Maker Lab. Hi everybody, this is Coach Greg at Zen Maker Lab. We're gonna be doing these unleashing summer awesome activities with the staff here. So I'm going to start it off with the floor ball. Here we go. These are things you can do with the shield. Thank you. 
Ever since I got this face shield, I noticed improvement by juggling. Stay active, try local. All right, so that's Unleashing Summer Awesome, the Monkey Bar Challenge. Stay active, try local. Stay active. Try local. Here we go, stay active everyone. Stay active, try local. Welcome back to the Design Make Play Show. Today we have some real special guests. They are my sons, Marco and Alexander, who have uh, created a really cool company called Middle of the Sky. Uh, so I'm gonna get right into this. Um, uh, how about we'll start with Alexander. Tell me a little bit about your, your background and how did you sort of, uh, what, what's a little bit of the background that led you to creating this company? Um, well, currently I'm a student at the IDEA program at Capilano University. Um, it's like a design program and um, during the summer um, since I wanted to continue some of my design work I decided to put some of that work into use and start a clothing brand. Oh cool all right that, that's awesome and uh, how about um, you Marco can you tell us a little bit about what is that I understand you're also in the IDEA program so what uh, uh, yeah. what's what that's what is that all about the IDEA program? Um, so it's it's a degree in design and visual communications and um, yeah it's just a lot of design stuff graphic design um, uh, like yeah it's mainly graphic design illustration too and um, yeah we just learn a lot of fundamentals in the first year and now we're moving into the second year so yeah I'm pretty excited to see how that goes. Okay, uh, sounds good. And the, the name Middle of the Sky, how did you come up with, with that? And it's a t-shirt company primarily, you can say more about the company, but um, how did you come up with the name Middle of the Sky? If you can talk as loud as possible, the audio is a little low on our side. So uh, how did you come up with the name Middle of the Sky? Um, we just went on, we were, well, we spent one day just trying to think of different names and we really couldn't think of anything. So then we just went on Google and searched uh, like star names. Um, and we kind of went on, on this website that had all the names of like these like zodiacs uh, or not zodiac but like constellations and uh yeah we just saw middle of the sky and it kind of it sounded cool and kind of interesting so yeah we picked it and yeah it sounds a bit different so kind of i liked it well, that's really neat and what what is the main product that you make um mainly t-shirts is our main um, product but we also sell like crop tops for for females and we also have like tote bags. So they're um, replacing plastic bags. So they're good for shopping or going out anywhere. Oh, cool. All right. And how did you come up with the idea to make t-shirts of all the, all the different business types that you do? Um, it's a pretty easy thing to print on. It's, um, it's kind of like a canvas in a way, but it's just a t-shirt and people could wear it. So it's, um, pretty easy to just yeah it gives you a lot of freedom to design whatever you want because it's a flat surface and um it's pretty basic thing so um i thought we thought we would start off with that because it's the easiest and probably the cheapest to to make okay and how about marco can you tell me a little bit about the process for making t-shirts do you have to have a ton of equipment or what, what how do you make a t-shirt so oh um first like first we didn't really know the best way so we kind of had to try everything so we started off with like um, just heat press paper but then we tried that and that didn't really work out it wasn't really good quality so then um, we bought a silk screen and then we just um, we start we started silk screening in my room and we buy separate inks and um, yeah it's kind of it's pretty hard you gotta kind of it's like trial and error but eventually you get it all done and yeah, you just kind of got to practice, and and we went for we went for the cheapest kind of way of doing it. So we kind of just tried to do everything ourselves first to see how it is. 
but um, some people might go the easier way and spend a tiny bit more money. And um, the more money you spend, the quality will be better, but you're spending more money. So it kind of goes by how much money you spend and the quality you have or the time. Okay, and uh, do you happen to have any of the shirts nearby to show a little bit what they look like? Or are you kind of keeping that under wraps until you officially launch? I think August 1st, is it? Yeah, we're launching August 1st, so right now. Our stuff is still, still hidden. Still hidden. Okay, we don't get the sneak preview. Maybe we'll have to invite you back uh, in August to show some of what these shirts look like. They're pretty cool design. Um, who makes the designs for your shirts? Uh, um, we kind of both busted. Okay. Who's kind of combination of of both of our designs. Okay. And how do you plan to get the word out? Like, uh, what are some of the things you had to do to start a business? So it's not just making the t-shirts. What are some of the other things that, that are important? Um, so a lot of it is marketing. Um, we're still in the early stages of it, but um, so far we created and uh, um, try to get uh, quite a big following on there first before we launch our product. Um, but yeah, marketing is a really big thing. Soon we're also going to do all of our photos for it. Um, but in the future, I think our number one way of marketing would be sending to influencers because it's a it's a really cheap way of marketing and um, it's really effective because a lot of um, teenagers or even adults um, rely heavily on influencers. And if they see someone wearing it, um, it's really uh, impact it, it, it um, puts a big impact on on the customer and they really want to buy it then i was going to ask you about that because i know here at the maker lab we try to get so, out for, yeah um, and Twitter and all those things uh but i notice uh both of you have i think um, quite a lot of followers in your accounts and things what's how do you um how, how do you sort of grow your social media hello uh, so, uh, Um, I think you just got to find the right target kind of, of people and um, I guess try to be original in a way like don't try to um, copy anyone just kind of do your own thing and um, I don't know I think just you got to research a bit like like that's how I learned I just kind of like went on Google and stuff and research so it's pretty easy you just got to kind of find the right type of people that follow you and um, I guess you gotta stay consistent on the app and post like I don't know at least like once a week or something. So yeah. Okay. And once someone sees you on there, how do they? What's the next step of them buying a T-shirt or a bag or one of those other tops you mentioned? Um, well, right now we just have like a link in our um, Instagram bio, but right now you can't like the site is available now, but you can't buy anything. It's just like a um, it just says like coming soon, but yeah, I think that's probably the easiest way because it's just like a direct link to our website through the Instagram bio. Um, and yeah, also just like word of mouth, I guess, like with my friends and stuff. Okay, yeah, I've, I've seen the shirts that look really, really cool. Uh, how, how about things like pricing? How do you come up with, should you charge like a premium price or have a kind of a lower entry level price? How, how do you come up with, with the price? Um, I think just, um, I don't know, I kind of want to keep it cheap just cause it's our kind of, it's our first time doing it. And I guess the quality isn't like top notch, but even if it was good quality, I would still want to make it cheap cause it's just, I'd rather have people kind of happy with the product than, um, sort of them paying more and kind of being like <clears throat> the same with it. So, um. Yeah, I, and also just like research other companies how much they usually charge for t-shirts and stuff like that. And and the, the pricing can is, should rely on the quality. So if you have um, pretty bad quality, then you should charge not um, too much for it because you don't want to sell something that's really not that good quality and um, charge, you know, double or triple the price. But also sometimes if you bump up the price a bit, it does um, kind of make it seem more high end than it actually is. So 
you can do it to some extent, but not not all the way. Yeah, sometimes you see these shirts that are like hundred dollars for a T-shirt, some fancy brand name on it, and you wonder like um, how they can charge so much. But I guess just people want to have that brand on them. What about the website? How did you pick which tool are you using to make your website, and, and how did you decide to pick that one? Um, we're using Squarespace, and um, we decided to use that because. Um, it has a lot of templates, so it, we didn't have to spend much time coding or anything. Um, so it was pretty easy to use, and it had um, also it also had e-commerce, so we could sell online. And um, we also picked Squarespace because um, I think it was on the cheaper end of the website hosters. And the good thing about Squarespace is that um, you do have the ability to do a bit of custom code. So we could personalize our website um, a bit more than other website templates. I see. Okay. And what about we have uh, some kids and youth watching the show that uh, we've had a few different young entrepreneurs on the show in the past. And we always ask them, uh, any tips for other people that are thinking of starting their business for the first time? Um, what, would, what would you advise them? Um, I mean, just do it and um, just... I think they got to realize that like um, they're going to make mistakes like we thought it would be easier kind of so you just have to try and see what works and um, yeah maybe always kind of plan for, for mistakes because um, we kind of thought this would we would launch it um, earlier but then there were certain things that didn't work or uh, um, you know just it didn't work the way we wanted to so you kind of got to adapt to it and um, also just try not to to risk it too much. So we went kind of the safe route and didn't spend too much money on the start. Um, some people could spend, you know, tons of money from the start and it might be less work, but um, more of a risk. So we took kind of the safe uh, route. Okay, sounds like good advice. Uh, how about Marco? Uh, do you, roughly how much did you have to, do you, spend to get this business going, to get your sole screen, to get the shirt supplies, get the website, all that kind of stuff. Roughly, how much do you think all that would cost if someone wanted to do something, something like that? Um, it's around like $600 for like everything, but um, that's because like we kind of, we tried to save money a lot and try to be really careful and find kind of the, the cheapest way to do it. Um, but yeah, I guess around 600, but it also saves us money because we're designing the clothes and we're kind of doing everything with the business. So we don't really have to like hire people or anything or like pay for a designer or anything. So yeah, if you have a talent, I guess I guess just use it and yeah, just try to kind of use your own talents. It's better than just like paying for someone else to do it. Yeah, that sounds like good advice. Keep the cost really low. Uh, do you think, um you're going to start getting some sales when you launch August 1st that will cover your startup costs or is it um, kind of risky you're not sure if you'll be able to get your what you've invested kind of back? Um, yeah, I think, I think we will cover it. Um, but even this like this first kind of drop of clothing, like I don't really like I don't really mind if we just like kind of break even and don't make too much money because it's more just about getting the name out there. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I don't think we'll, I think we'll like at least break even. So yeah, it's good. Okay. And then I guess we're in our last minute here. So just, um, uh, maybe the final question, how did, like you've had kind of regular jobs where you're working for a company doing, doing some different, different types of jobs and, and you've had this one where you're making your own kind of business. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of both approaches? recommend people to stick to the nine to five job or, or do this kind of their own thing both? um well we kind of only did this because we had time from quarantine because um i mean i mean yeah like i wouldn't have had this much time basically to do this so i thought why not this is kind of a one-time opportunity so why not just try it and um yeah even though it's like pretty hard it's, it's kind of it's fun when you like like what you're doing so i don't know it's kind of it's it's kind of it kind of starts off as a hobby but then if you could like kind of make money from it then you could kind of 
get more into it but yeah i think just if you like it do it but don't don't go like too crazy focused onto it okay yeah and also um also like a regular job is could be easier for sure because you kind of don't have to think much while you're there you're kind of just taking rules and um just following them so that's nice but then um and doing a business is i think it's easier once you're successful but starting up um starting up is uh, quite a bit harder than a regular job okay all right, that's uh, good advice. Well, thanks a lot for coming on the Design Make Play show today, uh, and uh, good luck with Middle of the Sky. Uh, once your store is ready, open for business, you're doing the teaser campaign now, uh, we'll, we'll have to send out some of the, the links uh, to what you've done, and uh, all the best with it. So, um, thanks again. I'll just uh, say goodbye to our guests here. So, thanks for joining Design Make Play show today. We will see you on Monday. Don't forget to submit your submissions to the uh, Canucks uh, prize for the maker of the week. Uh, we're going to be judging the submissions this week uh, at noon to, by noon today. So that's design make play at zenmakerlab.com. We'll see you all on Monday.